Chris. Um, thanks for having me here. I, uh, I'm, I'm just in Singapore for a week. Um, uh, I'm working with some artists, um, Drama Box in Chinatown, and consulting with them on technology and in practicing their artwork. And I, I looked online and I saw you guys have a, a JavaScript meetup, and so I thought, and there was one on Wednesday, and I was like, oh, I'll put in a talk, and you guys kindly let me come along and uh, speak. So thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about something I've been working on for a while now, uh, which is decentralized systems on the web. So do you guys know what WebRTC is in general, some of you? So WebRTC is basically a way of two computers, two browsers talking directly to each other over the internet rather than, you know, typically when you have um, like a chat program, you'll have your browser, two, two different browsers and they'll talk via a server. So WebRTC is like cutting out the server in the middle and just having the browsers send packets directly to each other across the internet. So it's a very complicated protocol um, because it has to negotiate. Both ends have to figure out a pathway behind through firewalls and stuff like that. But when you get it working, it's pretty magical because it's yeah, like just literally two browsers talking to each other. And so, um, yeah, that's what I've been interested in and building stuff around that. Um, and yeah, so this is, uh, this is what I'm gonna cover today. I'm, I'm actually uh, gonna start with a demo um, what, what could possibly go wrong with that, eh? Uh, then I'm going to talk about how to build your own version of um, the, using the library that I've, um, that I've developed. Um, oh, I should say, if you want to read more, that's a URL at the top, bugout.network. So that's where I'm doing all the decentralized stuff and um, writing about that and my email and my Twitter account if, if you want to stay in touch. Um, so yeah, then I'm going to talk about how you can build stuff using this library. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a bit of hardware um, at the end. And then I'm going to talk about some of the limitations, like things that don't quite work that well yet um, with this, because it's quite new technology. Um, the first speaker, you, you were talking about people just jumping in and adopting new technology. Well, no one should do that, because this is like very <laughs> unstable. And uh, anyway, this is my living room back in Perth. So five hours flight south of here. Um, this little machine is sitting there. Actually, this slide's a lie because it's now in near my kitchen because I had to move it because my wife said it was in the way. But anyway, it's in my house and uh, there's only one of what I'm about to show you in the whole world, like this type of server running on that. Um, but I think maybe one day a lot more people might run this kind of thing. Um, so if you go to this URL, uh, you'll see a message board um, and a message board backend is pretty simple, generally. So fundamentally, it reads some data, which is the list of posts that people have written. Um, and it, uh, it writes some data, which is writing new posts to the database. And then it talks to browsers to let people do those two things. Um, usually, the backend to that, like what I was saying before, would run on a VPS server. So a Linux machine somewhere on a, in a service provider's warehouse on the internet somewhere. Um, here in Singapore, DigitalOcean have a presence, I think, and Amazon. So you guys get really fast ping times to those VPSs. My own mail server is here in Singapore. Um, so let's check out the message board. I guess some of you might have scanned that by now. Hopefully it's working. <laughs> uh, where's my mouse? So I'm just going to... So this is the message board here. Yeah, some of you have connected. I can see four people. Oh, lots of messages. It'll probably crash. So obviously, if you look at this URL up here, it's loading the actual page and the code from GitHub. And GitHub doesn't have a server backend. It's static pages only. So the, all the data here that you can see is actually being sent from you, directly from your phones to that Raspberry Pi that's sitting in my living room. That's where it's writing the, the data and reading it off to, uh, to print it here. Um, that's probably the, the hardest workout it's ever got. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I've said all that. Yeah, so that's, that's what's going on. It's going from your browser directly to, and the, the, way, the reason it can run on a Raspberry Pi is uh, on this Raspberry Pi, yeah, on this Raspberry Pi, it's actually running not 
uh, just like in a shell or in the background, I've actually got a browser running headless on the Raspberry Pi, and that's what's running the server backend. So the, the server is running inside the browser kind of thing. Um, sorry, I'm just jumping ahead of my notes here. So, yep. Yeah, so that's what's happening. It's uh, the data is, the, the page is being read from GitHub, then the data is going back to a browser that's running on this Raspberry Pi in Perth, and your computers are talking directly to it. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, what this means is, well, one, one side effect is that I have physical access to the Raspberry Pi and the data on the message board. So I can physically secure it if I want to. I could put it in a safe in my house. Um, and you could do the same kind of thing if you had a computer, a laptop in your house, and you had a reverse SSH tunnel. But I think what's exciting about this is it, it, it is really directly browser to browser. Um, you don't need to be a sysadmin. Anybody can visit that tab and run their own message, message board. So if you look at the bottom of the tab here, if you scroll down, um, it says fire up your own copy of the server. Now if I launch this, now I have this server running on my laptop here. And if you connect to that one, then the uh, then your phones will be sending messages to, directly to my laptop. And the laptop's running the back end inside the browser tab. So it's a very different paradigm from how things normally work. We have a server in the cloud, and your browser talks to the cloud. Um, so what, what, what's the point of this? Um, I, I've been interested in the self-hosting movement um, for a while as a model of computing. Do you guys know what self-hosting, the idea behind it is? It's like basically running your own stuff. So running your own mail server, running your own calendar server, instead of relying on you know, like Google or um, whatever other provider you want. Um, yeah, so instead of doing that, you have, your, you have a VPS somewhere and you'll run your own mail server. Um, and I like this idea. I like the idea of users being able to c control the software. So instead of having upgrades forced on them by a company, they can decide when they want to upgrade. And they can decide, like I was saying before with the Raspberry Pi, if you, like my mail server is on a VPS here in Singapore, but if there was the equivalent kind of thing that you could run on your own Raspberry Pi, you can literally have your mail server running in your living room. And all of your emails go to your living room kind of thing. And I, I, I kind of like that idea of having sovereignty over your own data. Um, yeah, and the other thing is that it's easy for us tech people to run um, servers on VPS computers. Like a lot of people here probably run Node.js servers. And you know we know how to do that. We know how to SSH in or launch a Heroku um, instance or deploy something on AWS or etc. Um, but a lot a lot of people don't. And um, it's doing things like setting up SSL certificates is is very complicated. Getting a domain name is complicated. And I started thinking about what it would be like if it was e as easy for an, a normal for an ordinary non technical person to run their own servers as um, it, it is for them to run like phone apps. So you can, you can, you can install an app on your phone. Um, your, your, probably your parents, maybe sometimes they get you to do it, but your parents can probably even install an app on their own phone. And um, yeah, so <laughs> what if it was as easy enough for your parents to run their own servers? So um, what if your parents could do things like uh, run their own calendar server or your, they have some uh, reading meetup and they could host the forum system for their reading meetup uh, themselves instead of having relying on some third party um, or, or a Dropbox. You know, they, they have, maybe they're part of some other organization at, or at their work and they want to run their own Dropbox. Um, so currently things are very centralized and um, it's interesting to think about what happens if that's decentralized more and we can all do our own kind of stuff. So that's what's possible with this WebRTC kind of architecture. Um, and that, so this library I built is called Bugout. And you can find that on, um, if you go to bugout.network or my GitHub username is chr15m slash bugout, you'll see the library as well. Um, and what it is is, uh, a layer for doing networking and cryptography, so getting the, the browsers to talk to each other securely, and it's built on top of something else called WebTorrent. And WebTorrent is basically like an uh, implementation of BitTorrent that runs in the browser. Um, because it runs in the browser, it's got a bunch of limitations, and uh, you know, real BitTorrent is a lot better than WebTorrent. Um,
but yeah, so I was trying to make, make that a bit more accessible and, and more useful. Um, so the way bug out works is to treat the web torrent info hashes as chat rooms. So like when you download a torrent on the internet using BitTorrent, it has something called an info hash, which is like a cryptographic set of numbers that uh, identifies that one file. And that info hash is how all the other computers on the internet um, can find each other to share that one file. And so this uses a similar kind of idea. There's a room name, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, uh, yep. So, and all, all um, in, uh, the other thing Bugout does is, is uh, encrypt things. So traffic between nodes is encrypted um, because you're sending, actually WebRTC is already encrypted, but in this case, because you've got um, uh, browsers connecting to each other and they might not, um, you might get a situation where you have someone in the middle listening. So this uh, adds another layer of cryptography on top of it. Um, all right, so if you Google, uh, or if you search for, maybe use DuckDuckGo, um, if you search for build a decentralized chat in 15 minutes, you can find a article that I wrote, which is basically what I'm about to show you now, um, which is how to build your own stuff. And I start with the example of building a decentralized chat. So two browsers, no server backend, and the two browsers are sending chat messages directly to each other. So you start with, I know you guys are JavaScript developers, so you probably all know node, node, and you can npm install bug out and do this stuff that way. But uh, I'm just gonna show it with script tags because you know I'm old school and I like the idea of all you need is a browser and the JS file, and then you can build something. So start with a basic index file, index.html, um, and load the library. Uh, once you have the library loaded, you open a new script tag and create a bug out instance like this. So it's very simple, uh, b equals, actually that's got a typo in it. It should be new bug out. Um, so you create a new bug out object. Uh, and every instance that you create in every browser has its own ID. Um, and you can get that doing b.address. So that's a base 58 encoded string starting with the letter b. Uh, you might notice this address looks a bit like a Bitcoin address. Um, that's because bug out uses a similar kind of hashing and encoding um, when it generates the key pair uh, and when it when it uh, shows you the, that that's basically a hash of the public key uh, so when you instantiate a bug out instance it'll start reaching out into the network and trying to find other bug out nodes using the same room hash um, in, in in the instantiation here we haven't we haven't passed an address that it should connect to so the default in that case is to connect to its own address and the reason for that is if you have a bug out node running you can then say, you can give out the address to other people and when they connect, they put that into their connect string and they'll all connect to that. Um, but you can also use a generic room name, so a shared room name. So you might have an application, um, here we've got one elite secret hacker room and uh, every bug out in the world right now, if you wrote this code in your browser, your instance would connect to all the others that have that same room name. Um, so once you've connected, you can listen out for messages from other nodes by binding event handlers. Um, this is a classic uh, JavaScript way of doing things. So this first callback will fire whenever a new peer node is seen by your node that you've created. And the second callback will fire whenever a message is received by your node from another um, node. Um, messages can still get through from peers in the same room, even if the peer doesn't directly connect to them because they use a gossip protocol to reshare everything. So if you have, WebRTC isn't perfect, and maybe two, maybe you've got three nodes in your chat, and this one can see this one, and this one can see this one, but these two can't see each other. The bug out protocol has a built-in gossip system, so it, everything is overshared as much as possible, so there's high redundancy. Um, finally, to send a message, it's pretty simple. You just do b.send, um, and obviously you can like do a JSON encoded packet or any other kind of thing you want to put in there. Um, and that's basically it. The, these are the simple components that the message board demo, demo that you saw before is built on. It's just sending and doing, when it receives on message, it um, writes it to local storage. Um, and that's, yeah, so there's a bunch of other things you could do with bug out like RPC, which is remote procedure calls, but this is the core functionality that it enables. And the main thing, which is browsers talking to each other in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer way. So again, if you wanna go through that tutorial in your own time, you can uh, look up build a decentralized chat in 15 minutes. Um, so I was thinking about all this stuff and uh, 
One of, one of the big problems with building decentralized systems is, okay, let's say you build a something like Facebook, but it just runs in everyone's browsers and there's no backend server. Um, what happens when, if you, I've done a bunch of posts and then I close my browser and I go to sleep and then my friend is looking at my posts and he can't see anything because the data is not available, it's on my laptop that's closed. And so then I was thinking about this idea of a box. Um, so I made this thing called the bug out box, which is, uh, you can connect to it from anywhere in the world using its, it uses the bug out library underneath. And you can get it to do things like run server apps, which all it does is it's running in, in a browser on the Raspberry Pi and it pulls down a piece of JavaScript and runs it locally. And uh, you can also get it to torrent, do web torrents, so you can share uh, data files onto the internet in a highly available way even when you're not around. So you just leave the box running. So really it's kind of like try, I'm trying to productize this uh, first thing that you saw here that's in my living room already. So try to, I've been thinking about a, w a way to make that more available to other people. And at the moment, it's uh, very beta, so I, I don't know where I'm going with it, but the source code is online. Um, yeah. So if you want to find out more about that, that's at bugout.network slash box. So that's all pretty interesting, I guess, to browsers talking to each other. What are, what are some of the problems with this? Um, it's, very new, it's very new technology, WebRTC. Um, uh, and one of the problems is WebRTC signaling. So when you have these two browsers that need to find each other on the internet, they, before they can talk directly to each other, they need some way to rendezvous and to negotiate the connection. And uh, that actually now is very centralized. So the recommendation by the people who, um, like the big companies, Google and Apple and that, who designed WebRTC is to run a signaling server. So it's like this centralized server and you're, if you're building a WebRTC application, you use this centralized server to communicate directly. Um, that to me kind of like, it's still more decentralized than not doing that, than not having WebRTC, but that signaling phase means that, for example, if you were hosting a, hosting a chat that was directly browser to browser and some government didn't like what you were doing, they could close that signaling server and none of the browsers could find each other after that point. So I've been thinking a lot about how to solve that and at the moment I'm working on something which is like a, uh, a WebRTC signaling server mesh. So it's like you run a node and on, in the, on the internet in the back end there's all these servers that form like a cloud so you can't shut them down because anyone in the world, it's kind of like the Bitcoin network where anyone in the world can run their own one and they all interoperate and if one gets shut down you can still connect to other ones. But So that's, <coughs> at the moment that's vaporware, I've only written like the f just started that project, but uh, that's where I'm gonna, going with that. Um, and the other d downside to this is cryptography in the browser um, and key management, which is related. Uh, browsers are really leaky, you know, like they're very good at, uh, it, it's very easy to exfiltrate data from a browser if you're like a security engineer and um, they, you know, you can do things like piggyback people's passwords on CSS requests and that there's just lots of vectors for getting out there. So, um, yeah, if, if, we're, if this becomes a thing where it's more common for people to write systems that talk directly to each other on the internet, browser to browser, there'll have to be some of those security issues solved. But my feeling is it's better to move forward on the, on the idea and then hopefully the security um, from the browser vendors would catch up. Uh, and the other thing which I discussed already is where to store the data. And that, that's, uh, yeah, I think the solution to that is people in the, in the long run, I can see people running in their own house, actually like people used to, everyone had a PC at home that would sit on their desk. I can imagine people again having a little box that has their like mail and calendars and their Dropbox and all that kind of stuff. So I'm hoping that that's where things go in the future so we don't have to rely on big companies who sometimes cut people off or whatever. Um, and the other limitation that's not up here, it's not really a limitation, but it's something someone flagged um, when I gave this uh, a different version of this talk at a, at a security conference, is right now WebRTC is actually um, quite invasive in that when you guys connect to that message board, um, the, you, you can't, the WebRTC connection is quite opaque. Like when you, you know, when you open your console and you see the network requests come, going out, WebRTC requests aren't in that. And to me that's, the browser vendors should really do something about that because it's not great that users I, I'm sure, 
I'm sure that there are advertising companies right now using that to fingerprint people, like opening up WebRTC requests back to their own servers and it, people don't know that it's happening because it's not very visible. Um, so I hope that that gets uh, addressed as well. Um, yeah, so you can stay updated with what I'm working on uh, at bugout.network or follow me on Twitter. Um, feel free to email me or uh, anything if you'd like to discuss. And uh, thanks very much for letting me come and talk at your <laughs> meetup. What is it called? Build by this. Okay. Build by this. Uh, they also claim that it's a single file where you can bundle your application and then run it in your local. Oh, wow, cool. How do you spell that? Web bundles. Web bundles. Web bundles. Oh, okay. So, right now you have a server running to do that initial signal. Yep. Right? Yeah, so I've got, and actually, uh, the other uh, two, two weeks ago, DigitalOcean deleted my server here in Singapore um, and uh, then sent me a $15 uh, credit as, a, as like, sorry, <laughs> they just like erased the whole thing. Anyway, but uh, luckily I had backups. But um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the problems is I have to, I, I'm personally running the signaling server for the bug out stuff. Uh, because it's built on a web torrent, what I'm actually running is a web torrent um, tracker and luckily also in the message board and the other stuff and the library itself it has two other trackers that are run by some of the other web torrent lead devs so it still kept working even after my signaling server went down so it, it is somewhat it, it's it's not as fragile as it could be and like i don't know those guys i don't know who those people are running those things which i think is a good thing that's 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 part of decentralization is that like people independently of each other running these things but yeah it's I would like that to be a lot more decentralized than it is the signaling aspect. So, so right now the, the static front end is basically on GitHub, it's not yep. correct, and then the connection is initiated via the web RTC via that server. Via, yeah, no, so from, so your browser goes to GitHub and gets the page and all the code, and then the page is running in your browser and your browser makes a connection to the other browser in... Via the via the signaling server. That's right, yep. yep. And so if, when I finish that signaling mesh idea, what will happen is if you've got two different people with different browsers and they want to chat, this person might connect to this signaling mesh node and this might connect to this one and then on the back end they use BitTorrent to communicate with each other. So it's much more resilient and if any, if any one of them goes down, it doesn't matter because the whole cloud is still um, working. Into yeah, so my brother works for the company that runs I IPFS, so yeah, we're always fighting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dirk is his name, yeah. Yeah, it, IPFS looks cool. It's, um, it's interesting the way, so what IPFS is, is like distributed file system. So when you put a file in, into IPFS, it's kind of sharded and run across a whole bunch of computers. And I don't like that idea because I don't like other people and their computers. So, <laughs> um, no, I'm only joking. I, I like other people, but it's like, to me, that seems quite fragile. I know that they've got lots of awesome maths and stuff that solves it, but then I, I really like the idea of when I put a file on a computer, I know which computer it's on. And especially if it's like actually my computer. So like a VPS is good, but then DigitalOcean can just delete my droplet. Whereas if it's like literally in my house and um, my kid flushes it down the toilet, then it's my fault. <laughs> but it's like, it's, you know, it's within my, I can, I can prevent that from happening, I think. There are two big, company, oh, big companies, but it's two companies here in Singapore that, that work a lot with WebRTC. Um, one does the entire interoperability testing for WebRTC across browsers. So long because it's a horrible problem when it comes to complexity to make sure WebRTC works from different versions of browsers to different versions of browsers, <laughs> different operating systems, and different firewall configurations, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's another one that uh, often offers service for signaling and this whole firewall mitigation strategies and so on um, to be able to run services specifically for audio video though, right. around WebRTC. And yeah. so data is kind of a side effect of that. Yeah. 
that's the funny thing about WebRTC, isn't it? It's kind of like they built it so that they could do video chat because it's just much more efficient to send the video straight from one browser to another. But then they kind of like left this data channel in there. And to me, the data channel is what's really exciting. It's like you can have, it's a socket between two browsers. <laughs> yeah. Have you used the IPFS stuff? I haven't used the IPFS stuff. I've, I've had long conversations with a friend of mine who works at OLF. All right. Um, about it, and there were like a lot of interesting strategies in it. Um, specifically, it comes to caching because every piece of content has a unique hash, meaning if, if your computer downloads like content from a friend, like uh, there's a certain cache on your site now, meaning the content, if labeled available, is still kind of available. Uh, from your cache, meaning if your computer goes down because I loaded it from you with that specific version, um, people can still request it for me instead of from you because I have a cache copy. And, and having all of that built in, like a really distributed um, system for, for data storage, if you yeah. will, um, is fascinating. But, yeah. Uh, you know, you one can see always the limits. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, for what it, for what it is, I think it's kind of like aiming at a different area and also you know, like, my stuff is really experimental. I'm just hacking on things. Whereas they, IPFS are, like, doing it properly. Like, they're really engineering it, and they've got a big team, and they've, they've got, like, every language. You know, whenever I look at their, whenever I go to, to one of their projects, it's like there's, like, seven different GitHub repositories with every language implemented. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, a big project. Yeah. Your friend probably knows my brother because he works at Protocol Labs, yeah. The, um, the gossip feature, I was just wondering if it impacts um, performance, if it's like, if it uses a lot of extra bandwidth, or does it only do it if it needs to? No, it doesn't, just like, it, it probably would if you were doing something that was data heavy. So, um, yeah, if you wanted to do like video or audio, I would say you would switch to the actual WebRTC protocol, because this is like layers on top. Um, and then have the two nodes talk directly and use the, what, what that's good for. But uh, yeah, no, it, it, it probably would be a concern. I mean, my main interest in developing this is, is like the idea of uh, social networks and chat and stuff like that. So protocols that aren't super bandwidth heavy. Um, yeah, so. There was somebody who implemented a decentralized social network and uh, this New Zealand guy, Matt McCack, he had implemented a music player, a student music player, where like the moment you run an application, your music becomes available and everybody can just stream it from you. Wow. Like, so share playlists and so on and so on. Like, so it becomes like a social network around music where if you have somebody as a friend, like, boom, yes, your friend's music and you stream it in a direct way via a web RTC, then you build this as a, um, I forgot what the name was. But it was built on top of somebody else's work already. You build a social network completely distributed. Is that the, um, there's one called Scuttlebutt, I think? Yes, that one. That one, yeah. There's also another one uh, on top of something called Gun with two N's, yeah. and that's built by Malmo Marty, who was the first committer to the Bitcoin code base before, like after Satoshi Nakamoto. So um, yeah, there's a. It was really sleek. It was like SoundCloud, but completely serverless. Wow. <laughs> like it was just like a signaling server, something to connect people based on Scuttlebutt, but the rest was just all. Um, distributed. It was very fascinating, but then there's no marketing money, there's no company behind it, and so on. Yep. And it was like, it doesn't get a big push anywhere. Yep. Um, so it's maybe not as interesting because the people making good music might not be on it yet. <laughs> <laughs> you use this to like tunnel API requests to your local server, like running in your browser? I haven't, but that's one of yeah. Well, that's one of the things I think you could do with that bug out box idea is like have the services running on the Raspberry Pi in your house, and then you could yeah tunnel packets. So write front ends that run in the cloud, and then they talk to your own machine. And then you probably need to somehow translate the HTTPS requests into the WebRTC. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah. So oh, I see what you mean. So if you had an HTTP server running on the Raspberry Pi. And then you make like a request through WebRTC and then it comes out as a get request locally and then goes back in and yeah, proxying it. Yeah. You could do stuff like that. Maybe there's a better way to do that. I mean, 
Yeah, no, and, and I think one of the interesting areas is also like Internet of Things. I mean, I don't like buzzwords, but uh, having, you know, a Raspberry Pi or something like that, um, and it's got the pins that you connect to physical devices, and then you can, you can have a situation where you can have a browser that talks directly to that controller controlling physical stuff without having to have the server infrastructure. So you could just make it a lot cheaper. And I, I think that's, that might be one of the reasons why there's a lot of like activism around decentralized web and re-decentralized web and all that. But I think one of the reasons it might actually end up working out is because it, the economics of it are good. So if you're, if you're building like a competitor to Slack now and you tried to use this kind of stack, you would, you need, would need way less in server infrastructure. Basically, you can replace a lot of what the server does with cryptography. So, um, yeah, you can make a cheaper version. And, uh, yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> yep. um, how are the IDs you need? Do we, like, prefix them in the location or something? No, they're just very, very long. So, like, the probability of two IDs colliding is, like, so astronomically... It's the same as, like, Bitcoin pu yeah. pu yeah. private keys. We can like do customize like. Um. Well, yeah. So yeah, you could. Put, oh yeah, you can do custom room names. So the ID comes from. Um, so every bug out node has an NACL key pair, and you cannot um, choose the public key, like because that's the whole point of how cryptography works. You can. You can take a seed, which is a random string, generate a private key, and the public key will come out of that, but you can't decide what the public key is. That would take like the lifetime of the universe to choose your own public key. But you can, what you were saying before is right, you can uh, have a room name that's not the public key of either node or any node, and all the nodes use the same room name, and that means they connect together. Yeah. So if you're building a chat application, that's what you would do. Like if you were building a chat for your family, you would say to your whole family, okay, this is our room name, um, and everybody would type it into their phone, and they would all connect to that one room name. But they wouldn't be connecting to a server, they would be connecting to the pool of all of them. Yeah, but is it like um, separated by domain or something, or like each of no. them No, it's just a big namespace. So if you, if you use a, a key that anyone can guess, you'll get all these other nodes joining in. So. Yeah, so I, I haven't addressed that part, but what you would probably do is like some kind of, you would hash, a, you would take a password and do key stretching and then um, use what that, whatever that's generated and hash it with the room name and then you'd use that. So the whole family knows the password and the room name and it would generate something unguessable. Okay, so is there like a character in there or something? Um, there probably is. Okay. I don't know. Okay, uh, so like you haven't know, preached it. No, I mean, I haven't, I, that's something I should, should know and I should have tests around, but I don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Right. You know someone who will love to meet you? Oh, yeah? Cool. Thank you very much.